feel what he was feeling and to share the burden and they kind of didn't make it <laughs> you know there's a lot of times that the disciples just um We're just like us yeah. yes just like us yeah. we, we kinda, and and if he had what would have happened maybe had they watched and prayed with him so there is a, a like some pieces that do um repeat and one of them is the first bit when jesus said watch and pray with me and jesus said watch and pray with me he said watch and pray with me the world on my shoulders i rest would you watch and pray with me don't you please and the disciples say passages in the New Testament, uh, Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 29, and Matthew 21, beginning with verse 1, tell the story of the, uh, uh, of the Palm Sundry entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, on the Mount of Olives, overlooking Jerusalem, you remember Jesus sends his disciples to fetch a donkey. Um, and, and you wonder where the miracle is in this story because he could have probably just had a donkey appear in the bushes <laughs> next to him, you know, and, oh, well, then let's ride this donkey type of thing. But no, he sends the disciples uh, down into town to find the donkey and bring it back. Um, and, and as disciples... We often have to get into a situation where we hear Jesus speak to us, whether it's verbally or somehow in our thinking that this is the right thing to do or speaking out of the word, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we have to hear him first and then obey and go through a period of time where we are almost questioning whether or not we're doing the right thing. It seems like that... I can't imagine the disciples walking down there going, oh, we're going on an errand. We're going to walk into town. We're going to find a donkey. 
are we really going to find a donkey? You know, they've got to be going through some of those questions in their mind. And they they finally get there, and somebody says, well, what are, what are you doing? And they have to confess their faith in God and their faith in the Lord, saying, the Lord needs the donkey. And they have to do that with enough confidence to have the owner go, oh, no problem, go ahead. And... Yeah, I think at that particular moment, they're having this little cringe of doubt. Is this really going to work the way Jesus wants it to work? And sure enough, it does. And they see the miracle. This always fascinates me, too, that it's sort of a miracle just for their eyes. You know, it's not a big public thing where they walk into town. They go, oh, we need that donkey. What do you need it for? Oh, the owner needs it, you know, or the Lord needs it. And, and the owner's going, sure, go ahead. And everybody around goes, wow, that was pretty cool. I've never seen that happen. You know, the, the miracle is just for these two disciples. And then they get to tell the story. And they bring the donkey back. And their faith is strengthened by that experience. And how many times does God take us on these kinds of experiences where we we get an idea we think okay this is from the lord and then we step out and we begin to wonder whether it really is there, there was somebody who years ago had a teaching and i can't even remember who it was or any of that i just remember the the simple little details of there is a vision and then there's the death of the vision and then there's the fulfillment of the vision that might be 20 years later but you have this idea, this is from God. You step out and you struggle with it. And it all of a sudden begins to say, this isn't from God. And finally, it is from God. And you see the fulfillment of it. That's what's going on in the disciples. And that's what goes on with us and a message for us to learn. Now, the scripture goes on to say, on their journey into Jerusalem, uh, Jesus stopped at the Mount of Olives and uh, sent the two, I see that was the two disciples. We're going to let that one go. And bringing the colt back to Jesus or the donkey back to Jesus, they laid their outer garments as a saddle and Jesus sat on the, on the donkey. And as he rode along, the people of the area began to spread their coats on the path in front of him and others were cutting branches off the trees of the palm bushes. That's where we get the whole idea of Palm Sunday and laying those in the road along with their clothing. And as they're going along, he's descending down the mountain and on his way into Jerusalem. Uh, actually, they used to say on on their way up to Jerusalem because you always had to go down and then come back up to Jerusalem. And so wherever you came from, you had to come up to Jerusalem, that last little section. I always thought that was a funny phrase that was there. Now, on their way up to Jerusalem. And the people following began to lift up their voices in praise. And they were talking about all the wonders they'd seen Jesus do. And finally they shouted, Blessed is the one coming in the name of Yahweh. And a quote out of the Old Testament, a, a statement of praise and confidence. He is the king of Israel, they said. May heaven be filled with peace and glorious wonder. God is bringing to us the kingdom of our father, David. Mm. Such hope and expectation renewed uh, in these people. And of course, the leaders of the people of that day, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, all turned around and said to Jesus, tell them to stop that. <laughs> they shouldn't be saying these kinds of things. And Jesus said, if I do as you ask, the stones around us will pick up their praise instead. Mm -hmm. wow. The heavens declare the glory of God without voice or speech or language. Hmm. And then shortly after that, Jesus stops on his way down. He sees Jerusalem and he begins to cry. Deeply, he muses, I wish you could understand what brings peace. The peace you're looking for. But you're blind to these things. And 
how many times do we realize that we're we're in a situation and the people around us need peace but they can't see that Jesus brings it they seem to think that 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 peace comes from a little bit more money or another place to live or uh, you know some kind of resolution in a relationship and and all of that might be true in some ways but when all is said and done that peace comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, let's look back at, at this story here. I think it seems like, if we're talking about just the procession coming down the hill and the, and the, the guys getting the donkey, it seems like someone is always watching our every move. I, I, I may have told you, I, I, I went on a trip one time and I was doing some things that probably would have been questionable and, uh, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I walked away from it. And about five minutes later, somebody walked up to me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Ed, what are you doing down here? And I was completely, you know, way out of, out of position. And, uh, and, and I knew that had I continued in kind of the, the thinking or the words that I was going to say or what I was going to do, they would have heard it. And if they would have heard it, they would have wondered what's a pastor doing and saying things like that for, you know? And, and isn't it amazing how wherever you go in the world, I, this has been my experience, wherever I've gone, I've run into somebody who knows me, okay? And of course, when I do a lot of weddings and funerals and, and I've done 700 or more of each, there's a whole lot of people who know my face that I don't have any idea who they are. And they come walking up to me as if, I knew exactly who they were, okay? Uh, and, and what if one of those people saw me in the world? That's one of those kinds of things that keeps me on the straight and narrow. Is, uh, gosh, I have no idea who's watching. I don't want you to be paranoid. Don't be paranoid about it, because I'm not. But whether we like it or not, somebody is watching our faith in action. And they're seeing us as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And what we have to say and do demonstrates his love for us. It gives us an opportunity to talk about our faith. Do I believe that I'm part of that greatest story ever told? Or do I shy away and skirt the truth and exalt myself somehow and say, oh, well, I did it rather than... Jesus did this for me and give him the praise. And if we talk about that praise, Jesus says even the rocks will cry out. If humans don't give praise to God, the rocks will. You know, And, and so it, it, that to me is, is perfect because they lived in a society where it was pretty much sand and rock and a few trees crawling out of the crevices and things of that sort. And then the the olive orchards and uh, that sort of thing. But but they had a lot of sand and dirt and rock around them. And what glorious words, speech, praise would be spoken by that. I'm not a fan of the desert. I, I've driven through the desert a few times. I've, I've been to the desert. I went over to visit my, my daughter in south part of Phoenix. And, you know... I haven't quite figured it out, but everything over there is painted the same color as the desert. You know, it put a little color into it a little bit. You know, I mean, it just looks bland. But, but all of that gives praise to God when the sun starts to go down, or when the sun rises, or the sun changes the color of the sand from from brown to tan to red to orange, and all those kinds of things. There's glory there, and it all belongs to Jesus. And then that question, what makes for peace? Mourning over Jerusalem, wishing that they could at least just see what was right there in front of them. And we believe that what they had was the Messiah that they had longed for for thousands of years. And he was right there. He was was in their midst and and he was doing miracles and he was 
saying things that they'd never heard before. And some of the people were believing, but some were just saying no. And the leaders, the ones who studied the scriptures, should have known better. Should have seen. And they were closed to it. They did not recognize God present among them. And Jesus said, what makes for peace is understanding the presence of God. That's what makes for peace. And it doesn't really matter whether we're going through difficult times or whether we're having happy times. We can be at peace knowing that he is with us. As much as we would love to have him step in and make the situation better so we're happy, okay, our peace doesn't come from our happiness or the externals of our life. Our peace comes from the Christ within us, the the presence of Jesus in our lives. Yesterday morning, my my two boys, uh, well, not... It happened a couple weeks ago, but yesterday morning was the day we were going to play golf. We played golf at 6.50 yesterday morning, 44 degrees. And you have to know that I play golf barefoot. It was cold. Okay, it was really cold. But we we went out. Is this a penance, Ed? It's a penance (laughs) thing, yeah. You know, it's just... uh, no, no. I love the feel of the earth. I love, I love to, I love bare feet all the time. I'd preach barefooted, except, yeah, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, Frank, Frank knows my secret. I've got a pair of shoes that I can wear that feel like they're bare feet, and uh, I can, I can do it without socks on sometimes. But this morning, I put the socks on. I woke up remembering yesterday, and I said, I'm going to wear socks today. Um, but anyway. Um, we, we were on our, I was on my way to the golf course at uh, uh, about six o'clock in the morning and I, I heard a song and I, I'd never heard this uh, singer before. I, I've got Enlightened Radio and if, uh, if any of you have that uh, on uh, XSM, uh, Kim Hopper uh, has a song called Gospel to the World and, and the words were just, uh, I don't know, just, just touching to me about how the, the precious things of life are not the possessions that we have. Jesus lived his life to die, then he died to save us. He rose again in victory and proved his sovereignty. Now we can see his heart in the many things he left us as the story unfolds for all to see. And this was the chorus. His silver went to Judas. His body went to Joseph of Arimathea. His mother to apostles that would take good care of her. His clothes to a soldier. His peace to his disciples. His supper to his followers. And the gospel to the world. Yeah just powerful that everything that we might look at and say, that's where my peace would come from. That's not where his peace came from. And that's not where he wants us to find our peace in all those possessions and things, whether it's money or family or uh, clothing or anything else. He wants us to find it in him and in him alone. And that's the message that you and I have to take to the world. Kim puts in the middle of the song, I love to tell the story, it will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. The precious things of Jesus are his love, his desire to serve, his compassion for others, his heart for people, Mm -hmm. his mercy, Mm -hmm. and his peace. Mm -hmm. My peace I leave with you, he said. So it doesn't matter, going all the way back to the offering this morning, it doesn't matter whether we're giving to the poor or whether we're 
remembering his procession on Palm Sunday, or whether we're lifting up praise to him so the rocks don't have to cry out, or whether we're experiencing his peace, all of that comes to us when we believe that he is the God of the universe. And we get to tell that story in some small way to the people around us. I just encourage you to tell that story. We're going to sing hymn number 174, uh, which is Hosanna, loud Hosanna.